Good morning, everybody. We're going to get started. Um, so I welcome back to day two of the Rare Patient Advocacy Summit. Thank you for joining us in track two, Architecting Your Disease Community, sponsored by Malcroft Pharmaceuticals. I'm Emma McLean, and I will be your track host for this morning session. I would like to also welcome those of you joining us remotely through the live stream and would like to remind everyone joining us to download the mobile app and in order to use some of our highlighted features like the live Q&A. Today we will be joined by Mary Beth Campbell, Director of Partnerships at the California Institute of Technology, and William Davis, Chief Executive Officer at AT Society, who will be diving into action roadmaps in how to develop your regional and global community and why it is important to mobilize during our session, organizing and mobilizing your community of stakeholders regionally and globally. Let's welcome them. I'm gonna get started. I'm Mary Beth Campbell and actually I'm at this uh, summit wearing two hats. Um, one is, as Emma mentioned, that I'm the Director of Corporate Partnerships at Caltech, uh, just up the road here in Southern California. Um, but the other is that in my sort of personal uh, life, I am an advocate for the Bloom Syndrome community um, as my four-year-old son, Calvin, has Bloom Syndrome. Um, so I'm not affiliated with any one organization within uh, the Bloom Syndrome community, but uh, I've become sort of an advocate uh, for, the, for the group. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, the experience that we have had within the Bloom Syndrome community of organizing and mobilizing. So I'll start with a really brief overview of Bloom Syndrome because I think it'll be helpful to give some context as to why organizing and mobilizing was particularly important in our community. Um, then I'll talk about the uh, format that we used to organize and mobilize, which was something called a nano course. So I'll explain what that was and our journey along that process. Um, I'll reflect a little bit on the lessons that we learned along the way. Um, and at the end of the session, I think after both William and I talk, then we'll have time for Q&A. And um, I really do recommend questions. I think that's the best way to get the information that you're looking for. So please uh, don't hesitate to ask any questions. So Bloom Syndrome, you probably have never heard of it. Uh, it was actually first reported in the mid-1950s by a, a dermatologist, Dr. Bloom in New York City who observed uh, three young children who presented with a facial rash and that he also noticed uh, seemed to have a growth deficiency. They were uh, unusually small and so he su suggested that this might be a syndrome. And um, there's a picture here uh, uh, that I think Rachel's talk yesterday really probably resonated with many uh, people in this audience and certainly for me. And so um, we're trying to change the face of Bloom syndrome. This is my son Calvin a few months before he was diagnosed. and. Um, admittedly, I'm biased, but uh, I think he's uh, pretty cute. Um, <laughs> so after this uh, paper had come out in the mid-1950s, there was actually a registry created um, that was operated primarily out of the lab of a basic researcher who was trying to understand what was uh, common among the, amongst these children and, and young adults and whether there was a, a genetic component of that. And that registry tracked people and led to a period of roughly 30 years of very productive basic research, um, culminating in identifying the BLM gene, um, finding that mutations in this gene led to uh, people having Bloom syndrome, and understanding that this gene encoded a, uh, an enzyme that's involved in DNA replication and repair. And so for people with Bloom syndrome, they lack this enzyme, and they are uh, prone to more DNA mutations uh, over time. And through the registry, there's currently approximately 277 known cases of Bloom syndrome. That includes both living and deceased. So we estimate that there's probably about 100 people um, actively around the living around the globe with Bloom syndrome. So again, an ultra, ultra rare disease. So I mentioned um, people with Bloom syndrome are small. Here's a picture of a, a young boy in the UK. He's five years old. He's standing next to his three-year-old sister. Um, before the diagnosis of Bloom syndrome is made, often children are diagnosed as failure to thrive because of this small stature and also because there are feeding difficulties in infancy. Reflux is very common. Um, and what leads to most diagnoses is this photosensitive rash, although it's not universally present, it wasn't present in my son. Um, and so we're trying to understand kind of what's, 
why some people have the rash, why some people don't. But the major complication of living with Bloom syndrome is because you accumulate more of these mutations over time, um, people are predisposed to cancers, and cancers of all types across the body. And it's actually the le leading cause of death in uh, people with Bloom syndrome at an average age of about 27 years old. So according to the registry statistics, about a third of people with Bloom syndrome will develop one or more cancers by the time they're 25, and that number rises to 80% by age 40. So this is uh, pretty severe. Um, there are other complications that can be associated with Bloom syndrome, uh, immunodeficiency, um, early onset of diabetes, uh, some fertility issues, and, and a range of some other things that we see in the community and we're not sure necessarily if they're related to Bloom syndrome or, or not. So you might say, well, you've had a registry actually for over 50 years. You know what's kind of going on at a, at a fundamental level with, with the, the BLM helicase. Why do you need to organize? So when our son was diagnosed in early 20, uh, 2016, uh, we sort of took a look around and we saw that there was this registry. It had been established in 1960, but it wasn't particularly active at the time that our son was diagnosed. There was a foundation that had been created in the US uh, in the uh, early 2000s and it had done a couple of rounds of research grants, but had really gone dormant. Um, an association in the US and a foundation in Europe sort of started around the same time in 2012. Uh, those were volunteer run organizations they were just kind of getting their feet under themselves. And again, we were having a hard time kind of reaching out and, and getting in contact with people. Um, and finally, there was a, a website that had been created in the 90s and then it moved over to a Facebook group in, in, uh, in the 2000s. Um, but the sort of moderator of that group has a decidedly social support aspect and some of the posts that we had tried to put out there sort of asking about the status of research, researchers working in this area um, were not uh, actually posted or, or well received. So, you know, when we got our son's diagnosis, we were feeling pretty isolated, um, didn't know really where to go for more information. Um, and I think probably a lot of people have the same experience. And I think you'll agree that all of these would be good reasons to organize. But um, if I have to tell the truth, uh, we kind of just fell into this organization <laughs> role sort of by chance. And so I want to talk about that, that journey. And for us, it began because we were out there looking for data. Um, our son, uh, when he was a uh, two and a half, was uh, being seen by a nutritionist, and she was sort of telling us that we needed to consider a, a G tube um, because he was so small. And you know, we knew that he was small because he had Bloom syndrome, but we had no information as to how small was he. Did we really need to be concerned about his growth, uh, or was this just kind of normal for Bloom syndrome? And so we came across a paper from the 1990s that had actually put together some growth curves for uh, persons with Bloom syndrome. And we reached out to the first author and said, hey, do you have those uh, curve fits so that we can plot our own son's uh, data on there and see where he kind of fits within the Bloom syndrome population? Um, I should say that my, my husband is a, a physicist, and so he gets obsessed with <laughs> curve fits and, and plotting data. Um, so not surprisingly, uh, the author wrote back and said, well, the data exists. It's on floppy drives. If you can figure out <laughs> how to get it, you know, go for it. Um, but he said, you know, since the time that he had published that paper, when he was working as an oncologist and had treated a, a young man with Bloom syndrome, he had actually left um, his practice and had created a nonprofit called the Children's Cancer Therapy Development Institute, or CCTDI, to really do preclinical work on uh, rare childhood cancers. And as part of CCTDI, he said one of the things that they do is they do these nano courses, and that he thought Bloom syndrome would be a great topic for a nano course. Um, one of the things that I love about global genes is that it sort of recognizes the emotional toll that all this work takes on people. And so I wanted to kind of walk through um, the sort of our, our journey from an emotional perspective. Unfortunately, my cool emojis did not come through. So <laughs> I had a, a whole chart here of uh, where we lied on the sad face to happy face scale um, and a little question mark here. Well, actually, maybe it's, it's, a, it's a good fit because we were sort of skeptical, like what is a nano course? What it, should, we, should we do this? We were just kind of not sure what we were getting into. Um, and in talking with Dr. Keller, he sort of explained in more detail what these nano, cor nano courses are. And really, a nano course is a fancy term for a workshop that was really designed to train uh, members of the public, essentially patient groups. Um, in most instances, uh, they're dealing with uh, parents who, whose children have these rare pediatric cancers and getting them up to speed on the research and development process and how patient advocacy groups can play a role in 
uh, being liaisons between the R&D, the researchers, and the patient communities. And so essentially what it was is a, a week-long session uh, where we had a crash course learning from researchers who would know about the topic and the state of the art of the research, and a lot of time for us as a patient group to talk to each other and figure out what we need. So he said, you know, CCD, CCTDI does these, we have the infrastructure, um, we basically handle all the logistics, all you would need is to come up with funding, participants, and speakers. And so we thought, okay, um, of those three, probably funding is the hardest, so why don't we start there? Um, and so we, like everyone, put out a crowdfunding site, uh, put a cute picture of our son, uh, Calvin, with his Hobbes doll. And um, we were surprised and overwhelmed at just how quickly we were able to reach our goal. Um, you know, I should say my husband and I are kind of Luddites, and so we don't really do a lot of this stuff. Um, but we were really um, overwhelmed by the response. Um, and I think there were a couple of reasons for that. You know, we sent the message out on Christmas Eve, uh, not really intentionally, but that's sort of when we got around to sending out the email. We blasted it to uh, basically everyone we knew. And so for a lot of people, this was the first time they were learning of Calvin's diagnosis. Um, and I think that we really focused on, you know, what we were going to do is get people together and we were going to have this output of a really um, tangible output of what is known in the community and what do we need to move forward. Um, so at this point, I really wish this emoji showed up because this is the one with the dollar signs for eyes and, and the sort of ka-ching, ka-ching. Um, but we had thought that, that the funding would be the hardest part of sort of organizing and mobilizing. And for us, it turned out that that was the easier part. Um, and we thought, okay, from here on out, it's going to be a cakewalk. This, this will be great. So if crowdfunding was a surprisingly powerful tool, I would say getting participants and speakers was a surprisingly difficult experience. Um, so we reached out basically to all the heads of those Bloom Syndrome organizations that I had mentioned on a few slides back and said, we're putting this thing together. We have funding to basically fly you here and, and, and host you for a week. Um, are you willing to participate? Um, and there was a lot of skepticism and I think mistrust and, and just uncertainty on what it was that we were trying to do. And, um, you know, you have to remember that a lot of these people have been working in the community for many years. We were sort of upstarts, so people just didn't know what we were trying to do. Um, so we had to spend a lot of time building trust, listening to people, communicating what we were trying to do, and um, being authentic in our actions um, and really showing that we were trying to do something that was good for the, for the community overall. Um, we had hoped to post on the Facebook group. Again, that, that wasn't successful, so we had to rely on word of mouth. We were able to post on the Bloom Syndrome Association website. And ultimately, we weren't able to get everyone to the table, but we had five families come and commit to coming for the whole week, including two uh, of the heads of the Bloom Syndrome organizations, the Bloom Syndrome Association here in the US and the Bloom Syndrome Foundation in Europe. Um, and, and I just kind of want to reiterate that we didn't really take it personally when people weren't jumping at this opportunity. Um, you know, I think that people have a lot of history and, and baggage and things that they've experienced over the years, and we're relatively new to this, so we respected that some people weren't, um, weren't eager to, to join the, the effort. Um, and for our speakers, I, I said we relied on the usual suspects. Um, I would say that we have a handful of researchers who work on Bloom Syndrome. It's actually more like half a handful. Um, and, but we were able to get them to participate, including the current head of the, of the Bloom Syndrome Registry. So at this point, we kind of went from the high of like, we raised all this funding, it was going to be great, to sort of where are we and what, are we, what have we gotten ourselves into? Um, what is this going to be like to be in a room with uh, everyone for a whole week? Um, so we showed up. We, we're at the CCTDI facilities in Oregon. We had two full days of speakers kind of talking about what's, the, what's known in Bloom Syndrome, um, what sort of resources exist for the research. And then we had a lot of time for our own group discussions and work kind of looking at what we could do as a, as a patient community to drive that forward. And the week-long format really allowed us to spend a lot of time actually doing work together, but it also allowed us time to uh, break bread together and um, uh, have happy hour together and really get to know one another personally. So we found a Thai restaurant called Thai Bloom, which was very fitting. Um, I don't know if you can read those labels on the beer bottles, but they'll say F cancer. And then uh, the picture there, you know, we all got to wear lab coats and pretend we were scientists. And I like this picture in particular because that's Dr. Keller and uh, Zach Rogers, who's a young man with Bloom Syndrome. 
and Zach was treated by Dr. Keller uh, when he had um, lymphoma as an 11-year-old, uh, successfully treated, so uh, I really, that picture just warms my heart. Um, so we had a range of emotions over that week that aren't really represented here. We laughed, we cried, we were fooled around, you know, we were, we were well, not in that sense, but <laughs> we, <laughs> we were, we were um, silly, we, we were exhausted at times, uh, we learned things that were surprising, but at the end, the, that last emoji is supposed to be the little one holding, hugging the hands because I think we, we really did have a, a fondness and a respect for one another in a, in a way that um, really developed over, over that week. So the way that we spent our time together as a community was we actually looked at other um, rare disease communities that we considered successful um, and looked at the components that they had, uh, including things like a registry, a biorepository, a collaborative research community, a, a sort of a number of dimensions, and we looked at our own community and said, where are we now um, along these uh, various dimensions, and where do we want to be as a community? And we used this to then lay out a roadmap of what we felt we needed to do to get from where we are to where we want to be. And I think that it was really helpful to use this framework of looking at other rare disease communities um, and sort of breaking down the components because it allowed us to be sort of clear-eyed uh, about what we have and what we don't have without it being sort of critical about um, where we should be or, or what people weren't or were or weren't doing. Um, and it also allowed us to be clear-eyed about um, how much work we have, have to do. So we weren't, we weren't sort of being rosy-eyed about, um, about where we are. So, Findings and outcomes might be a little bit of a strong statement, but um, you know we really did get consensus among the group that we had to be organized and mobilized. We had to be spurring the research. This sort of outmoded model of basic researchers working in the lab and then suddenly that's going to translate to a therapy is outmoded and really is only gonna move forward with the, the patient advocacy uh, pushing it along. And that we needed more information sharing among the community that sort of when people are newly diagnosed, they can't face this sort of fragmented web presence, not knowing what's out there and, and, um, and who they should go, go uh, reach out to. So we ultimately produced two documents um, that we sort of started during that week and then we worked on for the following uh, several months, a manuscript that we wanted to be published in the peer-reviewed literature that looked at um, the research needs and priorities from this family perspective and also just an informational handbook um, that was basically by the community for the community so that when we had uh, new, new diagnoses, um, people could, could use this. So for the first part, we ended up writing a paper. We submitted it to a journal, uh, Frontiers in Pediatrics, Pediatric and Oncology, that basically had a call for papers looking at um, patient-focused roadmaps. Um, and it was rejected. And you know, my previous life as, was a scientist and I had papers rejected, so I don't take that uh, personally, but this is what really got me is the rejection from the editor, so it didn't even go out to reviewers, said, we feel that the primary scientific contributors for this manuscript have been the lecturers, basically implying that the speakers that we had brought to the nano course were the ones who had written the paper and not the patient families. And so this set me off. I was furious. <laughs> I just, you know, raged about the sort of paternalistic model of medicine and all of these things. Um, but, you know, ultimately, cooler heads prevailed. Um, we sort of took a step back and said, does it really matter if it's in the peer-reviewed literature? We really just want it out there so that people can see it. Um, so how do we get it out there? Again, we reached out, uh, you know, to friends who use social media. We reached out to a friend who publishes in the life sciences and he uh, basically said, hey, we ha I have some friends who've written this white paper. Is there any, uh, any ideas of where they, where they should submit this? And it ultimately ended up in front of Matt Might, who many of you probably know or know of. Um, and he said, I would you know, consider uh, molecular case studies, uh, which happened to be having a special issue on precision oncogenomics. Um, so it was kind of perfect for the topic that we, um, the topic of our manuscript. And so we ended up actually getting this accepted to molecular case studies as a perspective, um, which has been fantastic. It's now available on the Bloom Syndrome Association website. And I won't go into basically uh, the content of that paper. If you want to see it, it's uh, there again on the Bloom Syndrome Association website. But um, we sort of broke out the cancer surveillance and treatment because that was sort of 
low-lying fruit that we felt was critical for our community. There were no guidelines at the time on what you should be doing in terms of looking for cancers um, in Bloom syndrome population, um, and then how to treat cancers, which we're still kind of working on uh, collecting. Uh, and then that step two was really where we spent the bulk of our time as a group of, of what do we need as a rare disease community. And then we sort of laid out what we would say from the patient perspective um, are the research questions that are most important to us. Um, and then the second output of the, of the, of the nano course was this handbook. Um, again, I think many communities have this, um, but we didn't have one. And, um, Again, I know I'm sort of preaching to the choir, but this is so important for people. When you get that diagnosis, the last thing you want to be doing is trying to uh, uh, dig through the medical literature and understand these terms that you've never seen before. And so this is written as a FAQ. Um, it's really in plain language description. And it's trying to aggregate a lot of this information that's actually not even in the published literature. It's just in our heads. It's in our own experiences and putting it in one place. So uh, this last emoji was the, the nerdy one with the glasses, <laughs> um, which I, I don't even know if that accurately represents uh, what we were. But you know, we felt more educated as a process of doing this. But the important thing for us is recognizing that this is just the beginning. So this nano course was held in August of 2017. Um, August of this year, the Bloom Syndrome Association and the Bloom Syndrome Registry co-hosted uh, a conference where we were actually able to bring um, over 20 families together. Um, so uh, we're sort of still in the beginning phases of, of getting ourselves organized and mobilized. And I think one of the things that I uh, learned through this process is that it does take a lot of time. Um, there were plenty of times where I think my husband and I sort of felt like, well, this is just too slow, you know, let's just create our own foundation and just get going. Um, but we tried to remind ourselves of that saying, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Uh, and this is an ongoing process. It's not a one and done. It takes continued communication and uh, coordination. Um, I think one of the other speakers I, I heard said that they do sort of a landscape assessment every year. And I think that that's probably a, a good uh, tempo to have to just kind of check in at least once a year on where we are and are we, are, are we uh, organized and mobilized in the, in the ways that we want to be. Um, I just I have to say that partnering with CCTDI really made this possible because um, otherwise we would have been spending, spending all of our time on the logistics and instead we were able to really focus on the relationships um, and the, the content of, of that week. Um, and that we learned so much from the other rare disease communities, they're so inspiring to us, um, and that there's a lot to, to learn you know, just by looking at others um, and all the resources that Global Genes provides. Um, there's no reason that we need to be reinventing the wheel. Of course, things have to be tailored for our own communities, um, but uh, we can really stand on uh, previous work that's been done. So I just want to thank the other families that participated in the nano course, the speakers, um, the CCTDI, the Consano was the crowd crowdfunding website, uh, Bloom Syndrome Association, the foundation in Europe, and uh, the registry should also be on here um, as well. So with that, uh, thank you. Okay, yeah, uh, all right, I have to hold, hold it close. Um, good morning, um, my, I'm William Davis. I'm here from, the, um, from England. I have to say what an amazing experience it's already been for me to be here it's at this, and I, um, I just feel honored and humbled, really, at all the, um, what I've heard, and I'm so grateful um, to Nicole and the other organizers for having um, invited me to, to come. Now, you, you may be wondering, what is this um, funny man up here with a voice that makes him sound like every villain from a blockbuster Hollywood movie um, got to come and come to talk to me about? And I, to some extent, I, I asked that myself because there's so much knowledge in this room. Um, I work for the, the charity that I work for, the AT Society. Um, 
is a, is a very small one. I thought it was a very small one, but when you come here, you realize that actually compared to others, you're quite big. The 80 Society has been um, going for 30 years. Um, the condition affects around three people per million of the population. So in the UK, we have 165 people with a diagnosis. In the US, it's probably likely to be around um, sort of five times that, so sort of around 800 perhaps. So that gives you a sense of scale. We do in the UK, we are very well engaged with our population. We know all 165 people with a diagnosis and another 15 or so in the Republic of Ireland. Um, we're also very, we're also in touch with all the other groups around the world. So I guess that's some of the basis for, um, for, for why I'm here. Now, just let me find, I'll just, what I do with the, um, don't do with the thing, sorry, a bit disorganized. Okay, this, this was the, this was the title that I was asked to, asked to, to speak to. Um, apart from the spelling mistakes, because um, they've put a Z in instead of an S in, in the words, um, I thought, well, that's great, yes, mobile, um, organizing and mobilizing stakeholders globally, I know what that is, yeah, we, we, we do lots of stuff, we work with our organizations around the world. Regionally, now, what, does, what do they mean by regionally? So I said, well, I don't know if you know England, I know what region I'm in, the East of England region. Essex, Sus Suffolk, Norfolk, Hertfordshire, Bedfordshire. Yeah, that's good. So right. What about America then? Where are the regions? Where are the regions there? How does it compare? Well, this is how it compares. That's my region. <laughs> okay. I, I suppose really what the point I'm trying to make here is that I'm not here to to really to to tell you to teach you anything. Um, things that we do. Things that work in one country may not work so well in another country. Europe, is, um, Britain is very different from America. Things that work for one condition may not work for another condition. In my view, organisations are very much like, of, like ours are very much shaped by the uh, the conditions that they that they're looking after. Um, so, but what I will try to do is to focus on on some general principles that I think have been central to our growth and success over the years, and that I think are applicable and repl replicable um, to other organizations. The other thing I just wanted to say was these words, organizing and mobilizing the community. I'm, I'm not sure really whether we can organize the community, more mobilize it, and I'm not really sure whether I'd want to try to organize and mobilize. I know it's, we can certainly motivate people to support us and we all depend on that, but I think the reason that we have our organizations is for us to is for us to be active on behalf of the community so i'm going to, i've been thinking of this through much more in terms of how we engage with the the different um different sort of stakeholder groups so i'm going to be focusing much more on engagement um and i think if with with engagement you then get you you be, get, get communication you get um an understanding of the needs um of the of the different communities, and that allows us to um, to build communities, to build um, a sense of belonging, to build a sense of cohesion. Okay, just before I start, I better probably give you a very quick overview of AT. Um, it's very early onset, increasing loss of coordination from children who are born apparently normal. They're likely to be using a wheelchair regularly by, by the age of 10. Obviously, they have difficulty with movements, but they also have difficulty with eye movements, which affects reading, speech. Very, very, they have, they have difficulty speaking because you need a lot of coordination to speak. And it can make, that can be very isolating because they just tend, tend to sort of, it becomes too hard to join into conversations. So they, they can stop eating and swallowing. Um, so they tend to be, they can become very thin. Um, immunodeficiency, they have a mild level of immunodeficiency, which means they get a lot of coughs, colds, and infections. There's an increased risk of cancer significantly. But many of these things are very similar actually to Bloom syndrome. Um, and the protein, in fact, is involved in DNA repair. So, um, and sensitivity to x-rays and radiation, um, and a median life expectancy of 25. Death can come at any age, really, due to usually due to lung disease or cancer. So it is a it is a 
it is a very difficult diagnosis. Um, anyway, to get on to the to the to the the subject, building a community regionally, the, I think the most important is this engagement with key researchers or clinicians. The AT Society was set up 30 years ago but with, with the support of a, major, of a major researcher with an interest in AT. And over the years, it's been strengthened by the, the engagement we've had with clinicians. Um, I'm going to come back to this later. So um, it, it's also about making sure that you're providing what people want and need. And for many, I, I think it's true. In the first place, what people want and need is contact with other people in the same situation. We, the AT Society was, was born at a meeting when families were, a few, fat 20 families were kind of came together. And at, ever since then, our annual family, family weekend has been at the, is, the, is really the beating heart of the, of the society. We have, we always, um, we have activities for the children. We take the children off so that their parents can ask, answer questions and can listen to um, researchers um, and have their questions answered. We have a disco for the children in the evening. We have activities for adults with a condition. Basically, it's a chance for people to be together and it creates an incredibly strong, um, creates an incredibly strong bond through our community. Um, many, for many, we get almost a third every year of all the families in the UK come to this. Um, some of them come every year, others come when, it's when we hold it nearer to them but it is really powerful in bonding our people together. It also gives us an opportunity to get photographs, to get stories, to get material for use in our publicity, on our website and all the rest of it. Very, very powerful event. We also do once a year an activity weekend for our, um, for our adults with the condition. We know from talk how much they, it matters to them to find out what their peers are doing. They're very isolated. Um, uh, around the country, and this really brings them together. Here's the last year we went to Lake Windermere in the Lake District. We went canoeing and rock climbing. The year before that, we went um, we were sn skiing in an indoor in an indoor ski slope because there aren't any mountains with sn with snow in England. Um, okay, so I talked. We talked about re clinicians. I th it's, in it's incredibly important if you don't have them to set up as a specialist clinical centers. We set up one in the 90s with just a couple of doctors and over the years it's built up to being a, a, a full multidisciplinary team. Um, all, all the other 80s, well, a lot of the, all the other most successful 80 societies, the, um, the 80 Children's Project in the United States, one in Israel, one in Australia, they've all created um, they're on supported the, the creation of, of clinical centers. It's really important. It gives you an opportunity to engage with the doctors to and also with people who come the, with the people who come to be to the centers to be treated. We always have a member of staff or a volunteer there. It gives us a chance to pick up the things that we can help with, the social issues, all those all those other problems. It means that we can feed back to the clinicians things. We often things that we know from talking to families day in day out that they don't and and they change their um they change their practice accordingly so and it gives us the fact that, that we have this strong relationship gives us authority and it and it gives them it gives the the clinicians and therapists the um a strong a strong perspective of what families feel and what people living with the condition want this is, is a couple of pictures from, from our clinic in Nottingham, which, as I say, has been going since the early 90s. Something else that it, it did, we, through, through our close relationship, we managed to produce this clinical guidance document. In fact, I had to write, I had to write all the stuff around the edge, and we had to sort of conjole and force them to, force them to write it. They liked the idea, but actually getting them to do it was, you know, it only happened because we had this kind of very strong relationship. And it's, it's multidisciplinary. It's got about 10 different contributions from different, thera different specialists in there. But this is incredibly powerful now for, tool for our families when they go along to a, lo a local doctor who's never heard of AT. Here's the best way to, here's the best way to treat it. Um, 
Okay, communication, yeah, probably don't need to say this, but it's incredibly important to us in social media. We do all our, we do all our, um, most of our communication through Facebook, which just happens to be the one that most families are engaged with. There are two face, sort of two Facebook streams, if you like, in AT. We have our, we have our own Facebook page, which we try to post on a couple of, one, at least once or twice a day. And the families have their own in um, a, parents, a parents group, which is, was set up in the, in the United States, and you're always going to be at the forefront of these things. But um, it now has people, every, lot, people from all around the world. We don't, we don't operate in that, but a couple of members of our governing board who are parents are in there. And sometimes if things are going around and there's stuff happening, you know, there are kind of stories going around or things, issues, they may occasionally might flag, flag something up or they'll either post themselves something or they might say to us, look, there seems to be a, an idea going around that this, so that we can then put something on our on our own pages. So that's, but again, this is really powerful in creating this sense around the world and linking the different, and it helps to link different um, group, the different organisations together as well. That's just our Facebook page. We also we also have a magazine, a bit old fashioned, I know, but it's um, lots of people like it. My mother loves it. Um, <laughs> And it, 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 it's, it's kind of it's something that people, you can write at a bit more length, and it's something that sits around. People don't have to read it straight away. You can pick it up later. You can pass it on. And also, it's very important for thanking fundraisers because things, social media is great, but it's evanescent. It's you know, here today, gone tomorrow. And um, well, not here today, gone to in a minute later, really. So um, whereas this is something that people can say, yes, the, here's an account. Here's the thanks. It's sitting there. So we, we do that. Um, I think it's important to have a positive message. You, you know, we, we want people to feel 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 good about us. I'm not a marketing person, but we have this is our this is our logo. It's bright. It's not very good, I know, but it's bright. It's bright and it, it's it, it's it's colourful. Um, says what we says what we do, and it kind of works. There's a there is it on a couple of things. Um, but we want to have a positive message for 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 people. You know, we know it's a. We, you know, I've told, talked about how, what AT is like, but all of us, we only have one life. You know, we have the hand of cards that we're dealt and we have to make the most of it. So we've kind of, this is not high, this is not high level marketing, but we've kind of encapsulated it into our, oh, into our message, live well with AT, which shouldn't be in Times New Roman. This is for, there's real gremlins in this system. It's like, like the emojis. There was in a nice, it was in our nice friendly font there. Um, and we've even tried kind of, but there you go. We've even tried sort of panning it out with our, um, with our logo. But live well with AT, that's what we see our mission to be, to help the families that we're there for to live well with AT. And here are some of them trying to do that. We put it, you know, we try to, we merchandise is another thing, again, because when people are very spread out, it gives people a chance to buy things, it reminds them that we're there, we sort of try to change it. It's not, it doesn't make us money or anything, but it, it's just kind of building that sense of connection. So, um, we, I suppose what we feel is that we want people to feel good about us as an organization. Um, and our our brand, if you like, this is what we sort of, I suppose, what we want people to see. We, t we see and treat everyone as an individual. Everything, absolutely everything we do is about people living with AT. We deal with people with people and not with patients. And this is one of the things that's, that's what's one, one slight thing that I have, you know, I don't like the, I don't like the word patient um, because for me, it's very passive. It's very medical, and actually, we're trying to help people live their lives, and that's for me, for me what's important. We're friendly, we're open, but we're also very professional. We're efficient and effective, but we're not corporate, and we acknowledge the problems, but we really, really value lives lived with AT. Okay, um, the last thing I was going to say trying to get stories into the media. I mean, we're a small country, as I, as I said, we've got a, um, and our, our national media is low, is nearer, nearer above our heads than yours is. But we have had a couple of, a couple of occasions where we've, we had a, a girl, there was a big telethon 
done by the BBC every year to raise money for children in need, it's called. And she was the first ever wheelchair user to appear on this, this kind of event, which was on television every day for a week before when they cycle across the country. She was the first wheelchair user. That got loads of publicity. And that was really nice for the families because they, that, you know, for once they suddenly felt 80 was, you know, they could say, oh, did you see, did you see the one show last night? You know, that was, she's, my daughter's got what Ebony has. And we also had these, we, these two twin brothers who um, we, we made a film about. Um, one, of them is a very ta one of them is a very talented footballer who's just been signed up for the Chelsea Academy, Chelsea being one of the, um, one of the big London football teams. Uh, soccer teams, um, and um, did you know soccer comes from upper class Oxford slang? It's not a <laughs> for the for the working class game. Anyway, um, uh, and but his brother has AT and is getting more and more wobbly. But the two love each other, so we we made a film and, it, and we got publicity in one in cup in some of the big national papers for this film. So that was really nice for people. And finally, and I'm not going to, I won't, I won't stop on that. Strong relationships with other organisations. We do, like this sort of event here. There are kind of umbrella groups in 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 the UK that we um, that we link with. Okay, so what about globally then? Um, first thing is, I suppose, to find out who the other organisations are that, that if they exist. Um, for for the UK, for the for AT here, these are the organisations really that we are aware of, although. Some of them have only really started recently. Pick up the phone, talk to them, talk to people. That's that's what I did or originally, um, and you find out what they're doing. Tell them what you're what you're doing. Um, okay, talk to them. Um, yeah, talk to them regularly. Share ideas and experiences. Communication to link them together. I send out sort of emails because because we're one of the bigger ones. More. Um, I send out emails and cop, you know, to to people and send when when things happen, um, copy them in. Offer to share resources. I always say, look, anything that we produce, you're welcome to take. You can copy it, you can translate it, you can adapt it. I don't mind, just as long as you acknowledge that you've acknowledged that 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 you know it's based on something. But you know, there's no point in us in us doing them, doing things over and over again. It's hard sometimes to meet up, but conferences make a good opportunity. We do meet at research conferences around AT, um, and it's you know there's nothing like sitting down and actually talking to somebody face to face to kind of strengthen those bonds, and invite them to invite them to come and speak at your event. Like you know I'm here today. People, people, people will come. Um, here are some here are some of the events that I've been to. Those the one in the top left is um, is in Poland. Um, the one below that is in the French, the French group. There's Italy there, um, and in the bottom right-hand corner, I'm um, I was a kind of translate because I used to live in Italy and I speak fluent Italian, so I was translating for a, for, a, for a, at when Italian families met um, researchers and clinicians at a at a conference. Research obviously is the one area where we. You know, it's it's an area where it's vital that we work together. Rare diseases, we don't have, none of us have enough money, none of us have enough resources, and it's pointless if we're kind of all doing our, if we're all doing our own thing in an uncoordinated way. So what what, what I said, you know, first of all, just contact the researchers if you if you haven't already. Find out who they are. Ask them who 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 you should, you know, who they suggest you talk to. Quick win this one, set up a research network. I mean, we this was an idea that I had. We call it the AT Clinical Research Network. It's basically a it's basically a list of email addresses, which I which I do in partnership with my with my um with my colleague at the um, AT Children's Project. Um but we send out a we send out a bulletin once uh, around once a quarter. Um it's just it's nothing complicated. It's very simple because we know that people won't read it if it isn't. But it's like things about conferences that are coming up, perhaps important papers, calls for funding that have gone out, that sort of thing. And it keeps people in the loop. It makes them feel part of a, feel part of a something. Um, and in, and in, um, to go along with that, we've um, we've we we set up a clinical research conference 
we hosted one, the AT Society hosted one for the first time. There were, there were already existing conferences looking at the kind of, looking at the laboratory research, very deep kind of lots of, lots of graphs and path, protein pathways and all the rest of it. But the doc, which the doctors didn't really go to, and if they did have something for the doctors, then the researchers all disappeared. So we kind of set up a, a, a conference where we could invite those researchers who were most sort of most engaged towards treatments and clinicians together, and it was it was hugely successful. We had two, we had three or four new collaborations which turned into research projects which came out of it. It's, it's hard to do, but I would suggest that if you can do it, the great things are if you do it, you can set the agenda. We, we insist that the presentations are kept short and there's loads of time for talking. We can then write it up at the end and ensure that it gets written up how we want it to get written up and sort of and sent out afterwards. Um, and and it, just, it just gives you, you know, it gives you, and it's very easy then to follow up if you want to follow up and or arrange meetings afterwards. So... It takes. It does take a lot of work, but if you know, if you can somehow get in on one, get in on one, or get involved, or set your own up, I, that was very powerful for us. Um, just here's some photographs of conferences. Sorry, I like to put, I pick pictures in because they're better than um, bullet points. But I talk regularly to your partners. We, we, we now. I I talk regularly to the AT Children's Project. Jennifer from is there. Her colleague Cynthia is the research coordinator. I said, let's, let's talk once a month, even if we've got nothing to say, because at least it just keeps us talking. But in fact, we generally talk, you know, several times, several times a month. Um, and, and it's really important. Some, because when things can, things can go wrong, if you don't, I'm just going to give you a quick example. You heard yesterday, you may have heard yesterday, Jennifer talking about their fantastic global AT family data platform, which is the, the bottom of those two things. Now, we, we've also got a registry. We, um, one of the things that we did was we got involved in a cons consortium which was bidding for um, f funding from the European Union to fund a, a clinical trial. We s they asked us to get involved as a patient organization. We said, yes, but can we put in some money for a registry? They said, of course. So we did it and we got some money from registry from the, eight, from, from the European Union. In the meantime, we were sort of in the process of going through this application and then, um, which was going to be a registry which had patient data that people put in themselves and data that was put in by clinicians. The, 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 this brilliant uh, pla data platform came out with, with um, but so it seemed pointless to us at that point to have, um, to have data put in, people putting their own data into two separate things. So that was kind of just because we didn't one hand, didn't we? somehow failed to talk about that quite enough. So we sort of got in a situation where we were, I mean, we've kind of remedied it now, and we have one where we're putting in medical data and the others, and we're, gonna, we're planning now how to link them in future because we do work together very well. But if you don't communicate enough, you sort of things like that happen, and that kind of, it, it, you know, that, that's why it's important to talk. Um, the lo um, the, also, I'm just going to say another thing I would suggest is be proactive in talking to pharma companies, exploring the options for clinical trials. A lot of our families, for example, are interested in um, um, uh, cannabis, um, uh, potential use of cannabis. So we've been in contact recently with, with the drugs companies trying to find out if they would be interested in doing clinical trials for that. Um, and by going out and talking, you do come across you do come across uh, com companies that have have things that you could, that they can offer you on. We're now we're talking to one about a little trial for a drug now that may be used to, to to treat various different ataxias. So it's important to go out and talk. And that's really I think I've kind of run to the end of my time. I just like to say thank you, thank you to you all for listening. Thank you that team there of that's that's. That's the AT, those are my colleagues at the AT Society. They, they say to me every time, William, next time could you recruit a man? Um, <laughs> but unfortunately, the women are always better. Um, and so thank you for listening, and the very best of British luck to you all <laughs> in your... Thank you both so much.
Um, so now we're gonna do a Q&A. Um, so we'll start with anybody in the room who has a question. And remember, if you are tuning in, that you can submit your questions through the mobile app and we'll take some there. Um, we'll start over here. We have, um, also, we have microphones that we're gonna run around um, before you state your question. Ms. Campbell, um, you mentioned that there were existing organizations that you were kind of not working with when you did your initial um, work, that you kind of did your own thing and you might have ruffled some feathers, but eventually you did find a partner. And I'm interested in what that partner offered that the existing organiza organizations did not and why you did that. I think it's mostly a coalition of the willing. I, I, I think that the ones who have not kind of gone along um, mostly are just not that active. And so right now, uh, we're working with the registry, the Bloom Syndrome Association here in the US and the uh, Bloom Syndrome Foundation in Europe. Um, and we're kind of trying to figure out, you know, how do we either, if the Bloom Syndrome Foundation in the US is not active anymore, can we sort of decommission that or, or how, how to handle that? But it really was just anyone who was ultimately willing to work together um, became a part of it. Yeah, not reinventing the wheel is a great point, but I was just wondering um, at what point you say, you know, let, let's move on and find a new partner while you did that. Yeah, it really is just kind of dealing with who is willing to kind of come to the table. And, uh, you know, I think that everyone has good intentions, and so um, it, it, there's, not, there's not like hostility or anything. It, it's just we're just trying to do the best we can, yeah. Hi, I'm Lissa with Labor's Hereditary Optic Neuropathy, and I love when you were saying that you benchmark against um, other organizations. And my question is, uh, one, can you share some of the organizations that you look toward? And then secondly, when you did uh, benchmark against them, did you identify um, what they were doing just by what you could witness online, or did you reach out to them, or how did you make that Yeah, work? It, was a, it was a mix. I mean, I think we looked at, um, Organizations, or rather communities, some that had multiple organizations like cystic fibrosis, uh, muscular dystrophy, um, and it was a mix. So a lot of what we did was just kind of looking at what was on online. In some cases, we actually talked with people, and it was highly subjective and qualitative. I don't want to make it sound as if we scored along these dimensions, but... Um, but really just kind of saying, here's what it looks like people are doing. And even in the last couple of days, I've seen other things like the city slide that's been in a couple of different presentations. I think that there are a lot of different frameworks to think about patient um, advocacy for, uh, especially for research and development um, that can be used at least as just a framework for thinking about it. And please do check out the paper uh, if you're interested. Um, Do we have any other questions in the room? Over there. Thank you, William, for coming from so far. And you can see uh, the size of our country has some additional challenges to the regional meetings situation. So I would add two questions for you. One is um, about your funding. I know a different, we have sister organizations. I'm here with NBIA Disorders Association, and we have seven sister organizations around the world, and we are the fiscal sponsor for an alliance that our founder started. But um, I know we, in the different countries of our organization, our sister organizations, there's very different funding issues. And then also, just to speak a little bit, if you have any thoughts about those of us who have vast regions to cover, I would lo love your thoughts on that. Um, in, in terms of in terms of funding, I mean we um, we uh, we get our funding right sort of across very broad very broadly. Obviously, it's very dependent on um, families that do events to support us. But we go to charitable trusts and foundations, um, corp corporate. Um, we we do quite we do quite well on corporate. But I mean, I suppose that it helps um, working with working with companies. If you, if you've got families, the links that's best. But we have actually done quite well working with companies around us. It helps, I suppose, that we're close to London. Um, and we do get a, we get a little bit of money from the health service for the work that we do around clinics. It doesn't cover it, but... So we have a very broad, we have very broad sort of funding streams. But again, that's, that's hard for me to comment on what would be 
what would be appropriate in America. We do, we do well, and I think it helps our con because our, because we have a we have a condition that you know affects children. They're quite cute children for the most part, small, and they've not they've not got a very happy future ahead of them. So that's a bit of a it's quite a you know it's quite one that's quite easy to get people to to, to support. And I'd be honest about that, um, but. Um, S but yes, and so and so we do well, and we we do we fund um, conferences and events. We try and support as we can other groups around the world. But it's more practical support that we give to them. Um, in terms of how you people when they're very when the people being very far out, I think away. I mean, obviously, it's hard to get you know to bring, bringing people together can be, but it's probably more powerful if you can do it. Maybe you try to do it a little less frequently. We do it every year. You know, I, I sometimes I wonder if that's too often and it's going to lose its appeal, but it doesn't seem to. People seem to want to come. I think if you can find ways to bring people together, and then and then it will have to be things like social media. But I think it's how you and how you go out and just trying to create, trying, you know, almost deliberately to create a sense of community, a sense of belonging that you are all in this and that you are all on a, on a journey together. I think it probably it probably has to be like that. I don't know whether you've got anything else that you'd want to say about that. I mean, it, is, it obviously is a real challenge, but we, we get people coming in, you know, we, we, we're in contact with people from all around the world who come to us through our Facebook posting, South America, Africa, places where there isn't, where there really is nothing in terms of support. So, um, yeah. Um, so we are actually gonna now move on to one question from the app before we close in uh, um, order to stay on time. Um, so this question states, for the organizations overseas that share your mission, do you worry about keeping your logo consistent across borders? Is that something we should worry about when trying to build a brand or a name for ourselves? Um, well, no, I mean, I, the, the organizations are all different, so I, I don't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about about brand. I mean, I know that I sounded a bit marketing when I was talking about talking about it, and I think. I suppose I just want people to have a strong sense of us as a, as an organisation as something that matters in their life, and I think. But in in other in other countries, it, it it's you know you, I would just see my see our role as trying to help those organisations to do what they feel is best in their in their countries, and I certainly wouldn't worry about them, you know, them representing our brand. Um, you know, in a sense, we want to build this we want to build this sort of global connection. Just in terms of in terms of talking about other countries, I just I just wanted to say one thing. I mean, I don't know in terms of connecting in connecting with people. You know, you you are always going to be the big sister in America because you've got the big population and you've got the background. Um, in the UK, we don't have the same numbers, but we do have the background. After the after us, it kind of things drop off quite a lot because the the, the countries in Europe that have the or the, the countries that have the, the, this charity, this um, um, not, not, not for profit, self help culture, North Europe, most of all the Scandinavian countries and things, they don't have the populations for, for rare diseases in particular. And same for Australia, New Zealand, and these other places. And the other countries in Europe, they may have the populations, but they don't have the same, the same background. I think maybe in the past they've sort of depended more on the Catholic Church or something like that. They don't have this kind of self help thing. So really, if you're not in touch with your British counterparts, then then do then do that, and they're probably going to be be um, be kind of well. Some of them may not, but they're, generally they'll be they'll be strong, and they may know as well what's happening in Europe. Yeah, and I'll just say, I mean, that's a problem that we would actually love to have if <laughs> if there was a problem of being coordinated on on branding. But I think it's important also just to be clear about if there are multiple organizations, what the purpose of that organization is, and to cross-link to each other so that at least for somebody who's out there and trying to make sense of it all, they, they know that at least these organizations know of each other and are coordinated um, because it, it can be confusing, I think, uh, especially for a, a newly diagnosed uh, person. So we are now going to close. Um, thank you, Mary Beth and William, for that great discussion and insights. At this time, we ask that you jump onto the mobile app and take our brief survey on this session and then enjoy our networking break.
sponsored by Spark Therapeutics. Our next breakout session will begin at 11.30. Thank you for attending this, this session and enjoy your break. <laughs>